Uh, thank you to Sangeeta for inviting me at the very last minute to this conference. I was coming to India and she said, you should come, you'll really enjoy it. And I am so privileged and honored to be here. And I am, as Russell alluded, one of these people who had no experience in healthcare. I, I've been a patient, I've been a caregiver, caregiver, but I have never immersed myself in healthcare. And these two days have been an immense amount of learning for me, both in terms of the terminology, the philosophy, the thinking, the, 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 the urge to advance technology and adoption of it, and it's been really an amazing experience. So thank you again for having me here. <coughs> I think of healthcare as an amazing field right now to be in. In some ways, I think of it as the Renaissance and what it did in the 16th century, where a lot of you know art and architecture and music and and uh, painting and science and astronomy and exploration all came together to to fundamentally change how we looked at the world. And healthcare somehow is in the same place today. There's advancements in genomics, in medicine, in uh, in communication technology, in large scale platforms in the cloud. I could go on and how these things are going to come together and make a fundamental change in healthcare is really, really exciting and I think that's going to be really exciting to see in the next 10 years. So um, what I want to do today is uh, give you a little bit of uh, background from uh, a user perspective. At Google, we always take a perspective from the user. In this case, uh, I think of the user as the patient and the doctor. And uh, what we've seen happening and have observed all over the world in, types of, in the types of situations users as well as doctors are encountering, and then go on to describe some of the emerging applications that, are, that I've seen in the space. I mean, very coincidentally, I've done uh, a lot of like primary research in and just talking to a lot of startups. And most of those are trying to address the pain points that they themselves feel as users. So I'll try and cover some of that material for you. Um, so the first thing uh, insight that we learned was that clearly getting healthcare is not convenient. And um, I show a picture uh, of, of a hospital and OPD in India, but it's the same situation across the globe. People come from long distances, uh, people wait for long hours in crowded waiting rooms, they get a few minutes with the doctor, they may get sent to do some tests, they may get sent to get a prescription, then they go back and then they are supposed to come back again for a follow-up in a month. And uh, it's just really hard. And so as a consequence, what happens is people don't go. There are many cases we hear, and you see them more often than certainly I have, where if only they had come six months earlier, if only they had told you what they were feeling six, you know, some time earlier, you would be able to address their problems and the outcomes would be significantly different, the cost would be significantly different. But it's a common problem and it's a very human problem where people will not go to a doctor until they absolutely have to, and when they do, the interventions tend to be very costly. On the doctor side, things are not particularly great either. I mean, providing care is really inefficient. We've heard time and again that the doctor is overburdened, they have to look at a lot of people in a very short amount of time, they work extremely long hours, and, when peop and, and the people who come in are often people who really don't need to come in, and, and they are there, they take time, and, uh, and the doctors are always harried, and these people who come in are expecting some degree of connection with the doctor, and often they don't get it because the poor doctor is quite tired. And um, it's, been, it's been, again, you know, a very common scenario. My daughter is a doctor at, uh, at the University of, of California in San Francisco. She works 90-hour weeks. She works a full shift and the, she comes back home and there's the onerous burden of writing up her charts and her records and so on. And she spends three days every three hours every day just filling out those records for compliance and this is almost inhuman i mean doc the, the relationship between the doctor and the patient it's one of the most human relationships i mean people become doctors because they care not because they are looking to you know become millionaires or whatever they really genuinely care and these doctors are so severely overburdened that it's clear that something needs to be done about it um 
Technology and platforms are ubiquitous. I mean, you look at, you look, go all over the world and everybody is on their mobile phones. They are buying things, they're doing their banking, they are constantly chatting with their friends, they are playing videos on YouTube, they are doing everything possible, and it's easy, I mean, they're there. And the only thing that they don't do is really track their healthcare. That just hasn't penetrated the space yet, and it is beginning, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into some of those applications. But this is now a huge, huge advancement where there's a connection, there's a perpetual connection with the patient, the user, that can be used to, for many, many purposes, and those are some of the advances that we'll see. And the last thing I want to talk about is, is too much data from devices. I mean, most people are wearing their Fitbits, they're tracking their weight, they're tracking their, uh, the food they eat on MyFitnessPal. And uh, the other side of it, the doctors and hospitals also have a huge amount of data from pathology to radiology to EMR records to all kinds of data coming to them from you know, test results and so on. And to a point that an overburdened doctor, again, has, has a, a great deal of difficulty comprehending the data, just, just understanding, looking at it, and then to be able to piece it together in a fashion that's actionable. The same thing on the user side, you get your data from your um, device and you, you, all you learn is that you're not sleeping well and you're not eating well and you're not walking enough. But there's very little motivation to, to or very little, uh, uh, let's say, uh, nudges to actually change your lifestyle. I mean, there's, there are ways that people should do it, but it, it really isn't affecting that many people these days because as there is, there's too much data but very little intelligence from, from all the data that we see. Um, let's, I mean, problems are great and problems are opportunities. And especially in a place like, uh, you know, this group of people, a bunch of engineers, they look upon problems as, as great opportunities to be able to do something about it. Um, in the last, uh, um, in the last, I would say six months or so, I've looked at so many startups and all their stories start from a point of pain, which is my mother had this and therefore I decided that I was going to build an application such that this problem gets solved. There was a doctor I spoke to who lost a child and they said this should never happen to anybody. There have been lots and lots of examples and all of them seem to start from their own personal pain points. And all, I mean, technologies are incredibly good at finding solutions. I mean, we see what Uber has done, 40 million rides in the last years since they've been, uh, they've been, they've been operating. Um, there's uh, Spotify, Airbnb has made the ho all of the world's homes into hotels. And everywhere you look, if there is a problem to be solved, technologists will focus on it and find a solution. So where I want to go next is I want to give you a view of some of the applications that are emerging in this space. Um, there's hundreds of them, and I don't think I'm going to go into hundreds of them, but I'm hoping that I can give you some classes of applications that I'm starting to see. These also don't cover a lot of areas, so it's, it's, it's an incomplete list, but I'll try and, um, you know, if you have questions, I can answer about them, but let's go over some of them now. The first thing I want to talk to you about uh, the work that we did on, uh, on Google. Um, three years ago, I was um, you know, th thinking about Google search, and I myself have had uh, some long-term illnesses, and the first thing that we noticed that people did was that they escalate conditions. So what we do is we do a, a, an anonymous session analysis, where, so we try and see what are the sets of queries that people look at. And very often we'd see queries that start with headache at night, another query, headache, um, you know, continue headache and so on and then very soon we see the user looking for stroke um, pain in leg in child you know bone pain continuously every day and suddenly the next query goes off into cancer so people ha seem to have a tendency to escalate conditions even when it was not necessary a very topical one was when they were uh, when Ebola was happening in uh, Liberia there were queries out of New York when with people who have fever and the query would be fever Ebola there had been entirely three cases of Ebola in the United States 
But the idea is that people are generally hypochondriacs and they tend to escalate conditions. We heard uh, from, uh, from Lalit this morning where, where doctors absolutely hate it when people say, well, I've Googled everything, I know everything, and now this is what I have, doctor, please, treat, please give me a treatment for this. And I can, I, I'm sure there are people in the room also who've probably done this. So uh, what we decided to do is, is that we uh, said, let's provide people easy access to authoritative information. So with the journey that starts with a symptom, let's give them a list of conditions with a degree of prevalence. So when people complain about headache and fever, it goes to flu and not to Ebola. And then they can look, they can research the condition, and then they can see what the treatments are for those conditions. And this was done not so much to give them a complete uh, view of all of the details of the condition, but just to orient them and say, okay, so here's how often it happens. Here are the types of treatments that are that are prescribed and so people have an understanding of the condition and the treatment given a set of symptoms and that's what we launched, we launched it in Hindi and English in India earlier this year, and it's been uh, it's been very well received by doctors in particular, where they say now patients are not coming to us with these reams and reams of paper saying that I know exactly what I have, and please could you give me a treatment for it? Okay, so um, let's let's go on to let's go on to some of the emerging applications that are coming up. And I call these, uh, this whole class of apps as online apps for users where you don't see a doctor at all. Um, the first of them being online chat. I mean, people are using WhatsApp for everything and we are seeing a whole class of applications emerging where people want to ask a doctor a question, they just want to get, some uh, get an information, or they, they actually have a condition that they want uh, the doctor to treat them and all over chat. And in this case, we've seen things like people sending pictures of rashes, pictures of uh, um, kids uh, with uh, you know, fever and, uh, and, and they, they want a quick consult and they want a quick diagnosis and they are very comfortable doing it over chat. The second set um, we've seen is uh, where people get online prescriptions. I mean, we at Google recently launched this feature on birth control where we give uh, information about birth control. And we said, well, now you've got all this information, you shouldn't have to go to a doctor, make an appointment, and wait for two weeks to get this prescription. So there's an application called Lemonade Health where you can uh, fill in a form and your prescription will be sent over to you. You can renew your prescriptions equally easily. And the third is scheduling, and I've seen on the Apollo site as well, you can schedule an appointment, and, uh, and, and everything is done uh, online, so people can get an appointment, and, and then they can, they can go see a physician at some point that is convenient to them. None of these require any touch points with any doctors at all. Um, the second is, once you've made an appointment, um, you, there are, there, the access to doctors should also be convenient. So what's happened is that the, there's a prevalence of these urgent care clinics, each of them with their applications, where you can schedule time you, uh, with a doctor online and you can, you can go in, you don't have to wait, or you can, and, and these are typically one-stop shops where you go in, you have your tests done at the same place, and then you can get your medication and you leave, and in about 30 minutes you're, you're essentially done with your doctor visit, which would have normally taken you, you know, a few hours. Um, a new trend we're also seeing is scheduling home visits. I mean, home visits in, in, in India are probably not that uncommon, and they probably still happen, but in the U.S., they had entirely stopped. And we're seeing this new service called Heal, where uh, you can schedule someone to come into your home for a visit, and that, when you have a child at home, or you have multiple children at home who are sick, is an extremely convenient service. And the third, of course, is telehealth. And telehealth is becoming extremely common. I used it. Um, it you can do it sitting at your home, sitting in your office, and, and, it, uh, and it's just a very, very convenient way of talking to a doctor and getting your problem solved. Um, the next set of applications that I, was, uh, I see coming up are um, a personal health assistant. In this case, it's Lark, which is also on the watch as well as on your mobile, which keeps track of you, which helps you keep track of your life. How did you walk? What did you eat? And it, it's like a conversational assistant where you respond to it because it's giving you these nudges and it helps you stay on track with your wellness program. 
Um, the other set of applications are more towards, you know, uh, disease management. In this case, uh, uh, this this uh, screenshot is from an application called Tidepool, which helps people manage uh, diabetes. It uh, records your sugar levels, it tells you when to take medication, and it keeps you within uh, the bounds that you are of, uh, of whatever has been prescribed to you by your doctor. And we're seeing a lot of these come up as well, where people are being encouraged to manage their own conditions themselves using these types of applications, which are fairly deep, and some of them are actually even completing the loop in terms of embedding a device and, and injecting insulin and at the right, uh, at the right doses and so on. So these are all the types of applications that are that we're seeing on the consumer side, and these are not all. I mean, there's a, there's a number of them where you can you know measure. There's the device type things which I haven't talked about over here, where these devices with Bluetooth connect to uh, your phone, and then you can send the data over to your uh, your doctor or track it in your own um, application. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, provider side, and I've heard a lot um, in the last. Uh, couple of days about uh, how doctors find it really hard now in order to summarize information. Of course, there's the EMR, but looking through sheets and sheets and tabs and tabs of EMR data is, is really quite hard. And what the doctor needs is a summarization. What should I be looking at? What kind of treatments were prescribed to patients like these? Um, do a sequence prediction, do some analytics, what is the most important thing that I should be asking the, asking the patient at this time? And these are some of the applications that are now beginning to emerge. And uh, EMR systems have been around, and a lot of the question around EMR systems is not that they don't exist, not that they don't have enough data. They are extremely difficult for doctors to use. There are many, many screens, there are many tabs, they have to dig through data, they are slow to come up, and it's just not, it hasn't made it easy for doctors to, to see the data that they need when the patient comes in the door. So a lot of summarization and a lot of intelligence needs to be incorporated into these types of interfaces. And, and most importantly, although we are doing a lot of diagnostics and every, I mean, I, I, I've heard talks on people doing work on, at Google also doing work on diabetic retinopathy, diabetic and uh, telepathology, teleradiology, and so on. A lot of these things that, as the doctors tell us, uh, they call them these swivel screen applications where as they are looking at a patient, they have to look at other tabs, they have to swivel their heads, go to another screen to see what uh, this uh, other application is telling them. And very often, um, it's, they just don't have the time to do it. So it's really, really important that all of these diagnostics, all of the intelligence, all of the predictive analytics be available at the right time and at the right place for the doctors. And these are some of the, some of the, uh, some of the advances that we will see in usability and human uh, computer interaction and so on that will make the lives of doctors easier. So. Um, I think technology is going to be uh, a big enabler in the entire healthcare system, all the way from the patient to the doctor to uh, all of the artificial intelligence uh, and deep neural networks and learning that is going to be brought in to bear on, uh, on essentially the doctor and patient relationship. And we hope that all of these things come together in a way as uh, that it enables people to live happier and healthier lives because that eventually is really our goal. So thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to address you. Thank you. <laughs>